Welcome to Integration, a weekly program that celebrates diversity in Canada. I'm your host, Hoden Nalea. Thank you so much for joining us today as we continue conversations that matter in our country and bring diverse communities together. You can always follow us online at Integration TV 24-7 on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. We enjoy engaging with our communities online as well as on television. On today's show, we bring you a special topic conversation on Black Lives Matter. Many people have asked about this movement and what it symbolizes in Canada. And today we bring together two panelists that will share with us their points of view on what Black Lives Matter means in Canada. But greater than that, with Somali community facing many challenges, including police brutality, with recent deaths of Abdurrahman Abdi in Ottawa, this is an, op an open conversation that starts a dialogue that's important in our community. Black Lives Matter and anti-black racism in Canada is the conversation we'll have today. Desmond Cole is a journalist and activist in Toronto. He writes for the Toronto Star and can be heard weekly on News Talk 1010. He's currently writing a book about black Canadians. Hashem Youssef is an organizer with Black Lives Matter Toronto. He is a fourth year criminology student at the University of Toronto and he's very passionate about eradicating anti-black racism in Canada. Welcome guys to Integration. Thank you. Thank you so much for both of you being here on your busy schedules. Really appreciate it. Um, Hashem, I'll start with you. What is Black Lives Matter? Uh, so basically Black Lives Matter is an international movement. Uh, built to basically uh, uh, fight against anti-black racism. We started out in the States, moved out to Canada, it's now happening across the world. And basically, the, we're just fight for as best as we can, fighting against anti-blackness, anti-black racism, uh, state-sanctioned racism, state-sanctioned violence against black bodies, and things like that. And we're just doing that in a different multitude of different ways, as, different, as diverse as we can. Now, what does that mean in the greater context of Canadian society? So, in the greater context of Canadian society, a lot of Canadians like to look at Canada as if there is no racism or there's no anti-blackness because uh, we look at the example of the United States down south and we think that oh, we're better off than them, you know? But just because you have less people doesn't mean that there isn't the same situation happening over here. There is anti-black racism, there is anti-blackness, there is snake sanctioned violence here in Canada, in Ontario, in Toronto. And this is something that we need to talk about, it's something that we need to fight against, right? So in terms of the context here in Canada, um, I'll give you an example where uh, the Canadian population of black people is a very small number of the population, I believe is 3%, but within the federal prison system we make up a much larger population. And it's not because black people are somehow uh, committing more crimes, it's just that we're being criminalized by the system over and over and over again. And this is something that again a lot of folks don't talk about. A lot of folks don't talk about how police are constantly carting black youth and brown youth within the city of Toronto constantly over and over again. That's something that criminalizes them within the system too. Right? Now these are issues that we need to talk about and we need to do our best to work to eradicate. Now Desmond, you basically kicked off a storm when you wrote an article about being carted by police so many times. Mm. Tell us about that experience. So first of all, for your audience that don't know, hold on, um, carting, this term that we use, means when police officers stop individuals and ask them for their personal information. But specifically, they do it when those people are not suspected of any crime. You might just be walking down the street. Uh, this happens to people when they're driving their car, going to pick up your kids from school, driving to work, whatever the case may be, and you're stopped by the police and they demand that you give them identification. They don't say that you're under arrest. They don't say you've even done anything wrong. I wrote about this in May of last year for Toronto Life magazine. It was a cover story. And you see, this happens all the time. This is not something new to my experience or special to me. Um, but I had the opportunity to write about it and to describe what that sounds like, what it looks like in our communities, what it looked like when it happened to me, just how often it happens. So for example, um, in Toronto in 2013, you know, we have a black population in Toronto that's about uh, 9%, but 25 or 26% of the people being carted in Toronto were black. So just to give you an idea of just how overrepresented we are for this police behavior, and, and, I, and, and of course people always try to justify this. They will try to suggest that well, maybe black people are doing something which is making them get stopped and carted. 
But I always remind people, carding does not mean you've done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. There is no suspicion of criminal wrongdoing. It's just police fishing for information and treating black bodies as though we are more likely to do something, as though we are more likely to commit a crime even before anything has happened. So this is happening a lot in our low-income communities in Toronto, and it's happening even in white communities where a black person enters that community and people feel like they don't belong there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the biggest discussion is going to be around how does a Somali community now fit into this picture because a lot of the, you're of Somali heritage, Hashem, and a lot of our community is living in what we say low income areas and being exposed to police carding. Um, so how does that fit into the Black Lives Matter context? I think with that, it's a twofold issue. Uh, first off, on behalf of the Somali community, it's something that we need to work on is trying not to isolate ourselves from the larger black community, you know? Uh, there will be times where a lot of like uh, old, like Somali mothers would tell their children don't hang out with the other black kids, you know? And there's a lot of like really internalized discrimination that's happening within the Somali community because they've been fed this, um, this idea that again, black people in general are not something you should be socializing with, you know? So there's lots of internalized stuff going on over there and this is something that we need to work on to stop isolating ourselves from the larger black community. Because again, we are black too, you know? And when it comes to the system, the system still views us as black, right? So this is something we need to work against to stop. And in terms of the black community in general, um, it's on their part too, because a lot of times the larger black community won't even view us as black, you know? Uh, sometimes they're called like, you know, dark skinned Arabs or things like that, right? And this is something that the black community needs to work on also to change. But again, as I said, it's twofold. We should be working together because again, when it comes to the system, when it comes to larger Canadian society, we're all viewed as black, we're all treated as black, and we're all treated negatively. I want to continue this conversation because I think it's important for Somali Canadians to understand what this means for them because a lot of times the Black Lives Matter movement is seen as separate from our community. Mm. But how did this case bring this movement together with this community? Well, um, I think maybe Hashem can speak specifically to that a little bit more, but in terms of the details of the case itself, Abdirahman Abdi was 37 years old. He was in a cafe close to his home in Ottawa that he went to on a regular basis. The police were called on him after he allegedly had um, an incident with somebody inside the cafe. And when the police responded to the scene, they chased him. When they caught up with him, uh, according to several eyewitnesses, they beat him very badly. They continued to beat him after putting handcuffs on him and he passed out and lost consciousness and never awoke again. You know, watching that video to me was very disturbing because it's such an inhumane thing when police can watch somebody die and they handcuff them still. I thought that of all of the things that went on in that situation, that was the most disturbing for me, is the idea that police officers have somebody handcuffed who then falls unconscious and are standing over that individual as if helping them is not a priority. And so because that image was broadcast, because the images of people, uh, he, he, was, he was captured by the police right in front of his own apartment building. People from the apartment building, including his family members, were screaming at the police to stop hurting him and to help him. These images went fact, everywhere. Another fact is that also he may have had mental illness. This is what his family says, yes. And the, and the family was screaming, telling the police, please stop, he's not all mentally together. Like, you know what I mean? There's an aut autism possibly. I'm not, I'm not sure what the diagnosis was because we can't state that. But many people are heard and screaming in the video saying that. And so now two police officers, uh, David Weir and Daniel Montesan, are under investigation by what we call the Special Investigations Unit, which is called in when police are alleged to have harmed or killed somebody. The Special Investigations Unit has a terrible record of convicting police, or sorry, of charging police officers. 97% of the time under Special Investigations Unit investigations, no police officer is charged. But that is where the situation is now. Well, what surprised me too, Desmond, you're very active on Twitter, which I love, because I think Twitter has given a voice to many communities that never had a voice before, or social media per se. Mm -hmm. So what was interesting was that the mayor of Ottawa is engaging with you, arguing about this case, 
and watching someone die in, inhumanely on television. Like, how do you, I mean, to me, you can defend anyone, but the reality is it's human lives at the end of the day. And whether he's black or white, it doesn't matter. It's somebody dying that you handcuffed and you watch die. So Jim Watson, the mayor of Ottawa, has spent, I think, more time attacking people who ask him for accountability than he has trying to deal with this issue. Uh, he was silent for 48 hours after Abdi Rahman Abdi died. 48 hours, a man in his own city dying at the hands of police, and the mayor, Jim Watson, didn't see it fit to have any kind of response. This is what I think began to um, mobilize the Somali community, and I think maybe you can talk to that a little bit more, Hashem, because people were so angry that the mayor and other public officials had no response to this. Do you think that means they don't think these lives matter? I, I, think, I think it's very clear. Or are they defending what you say with the SIU having a 97% acquittal rate of wrongdoing for police? Well, what we see is something like this happens and the public officials will often say, oh, we have to wait until all of the facts are in. For myself, I don't need to wait for the SIU to talk about why your police officers stood over a man who was dying and didn't help him. No investigation is going to change my mind about the fact that that is wrong. That is not a, re a responsibility of a police officer. When that man was detained, they had to help him, and they failed in that very basic responsibility. But is this a case that's seen actually in a lot of videos where, not even just in Canada, but in the US, where police watch people die and they don't even help? A majority, when they tend to be black, they're not given life-saving ways. This is the same, same thing that happened with Andrew Loku, a 45-year-old black father of five, who was killed by the police in his apartment building last year, and again, for at least 11 minutes after the police shot Andrew Loku, they stood over and around his body, and after 11 minutes, for some reason, at the same time as the paramedics were coming up the stairs, then the police decided to administer CPR to this black man. It was too late. Now, Hashem, you were in Ottawa um, with the demonstrations. So basically, when the police said that this person, I'm sorry, Abdurrahman Abdi was alive still when he went to the hospital, but when the family said that he was already dead, where does the discrepancies come from? Um, so this is something that we really need to talk about. Like when uh, we house, when we did our action after the death of Abdurrahman Abdi, we used a series of demands. And one of those demands was for an investigation by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care into how the Ottawa police corroborated with the Ottawa paramedics in the Ottawa hospital about withholding information from Abdurrahman Abdi's family regarding his time of death, right? They were told that he was still, that he was, uh, still alive when he went to the hospital, yet he was dead before he went to the hospital. He was dead when he was on the ground after he was beaten to death by the police officers. Yet his family was still told that he was alive. Why is this happening? Like the, the paramedics in the hospital are, be, are supposed to be the people who are supposed to be treating you, supposed to be telling the truth. Like they're supposed to be different from the police. Yet we're seeing that they're now collaborating with the police, with the special investigation unit, and withholding information from the family, and from the public, and from the media. Right? This is something we really should be talking about. It's something that should be uh, that we should be doing our best to fix the situation. Now, in terms like a, how this case has gone over the largest Somali community in general. Um, I think this has ignited the Somali community because like over the series of like, times I've been to different like uh, Black Lives Matter Toronto, different events, actions and stuff like that, there hasn't been much of a Somali presence there. But when we did the rally at the Special Investigations Unit headquarters, I saw a large Somali community presence there. I saw all these different aunties, all these different uncles, all these different people I haven't seen in a while who came to the rally. And even then, in like my apartment complex I live in, there are a lot of Somali people that live in the apartment complex. And a lot of them were coming up to me saying, like, thank you for doing this, thank you for doing this. When is the next action happening? When is the next protest happening? I'll be there. Just let me know. Take my number. I'm going to come. You know? So I think this is something that really has ignited the Somali community. And this is something that the Somali community cares for. Because, again, one of our people has just been killed for no just reason. Absolutely. And I think it kind of brings into more issues about how police deal with the mentally ill also mm -hmm. and uh, in, a, in a greater context of Canadian society because there is, has to be a certain level of compassion for people that are not necessarily, you know, capable of making certain decisions for themselves in our societies, correct? Mm -hmm. Not only that, I don't think that there's any 
idea that he was a threat. That's the thing that's so disturbing about it, is that Abdel Rahman Abdi should still be alive. Absolutely. And now we'd like to, in our last segment, kind of wrap up and talk with Hashim about what are the, some of the successes Black Lives Matter have had in Canada since they started two years ago. Um, so one thing that we did was uh, during winter last year, we held we held a two week r uh, rally in occupation of the Toronto Police Headquarters, uh, basically in response to a couple of different things. First off, uh, the city of Toronto cut the funding, cut the time for the city's Afrofest. So this is a festival that celebrates blackness within the city, that celebrates black culture and things like that. And the city cut a lot of the funding, they cut the time for it because apparently there were noise complaints or something about it. But that was also part of our demands. And I think that was one of our first demands that was actually met and it was agreed to when we were doing the, when we were doing the 10 city action. Um, after that, what, one of the other things we were also asking for was a public coroner's inquest into the death of Andrew Loku, right? Um, this is something that should have been done from the beginning, but it obviously was not done. So we had to push them to do this. And I think we did this to our, again, our two week occupation of uh, the Toronto Police Headquarters and it's something that was agreed to. Um, another thing that we did was that we're also focusing on the anti-blackness, anti-black racism within the LGBTQ community within Toronto, right? Um, so we did a, a very short and a very small protest, but a very uh, divisive protest apparently during the Toronto uh, Toronto Pride Parade. Um, once we did this, it caused a lot of different uproar, caused a lot of talk about it and stuff like that, but at least finally we were talking about it. And we have gotten uh, tr the Pride Toronto, the official like body itself, to actually talk about this, to actually address it, to address it during their town halls, to address it during the statement they're releasing, they're gonna work on doing this, that we're gonna work on all the demands that we send into them. So those are just some of the few different uh, victories that we have in the past. One thing that I also wanna talk about is um, some demands that we have right now regarding the Abdirman Abdi case, right? So one of the demands that I mentioned earlier was for the Minister of Long-Term uh, long Health and Care to investigate into how the Ottawa Police corroborated with the Ottawa Hospitals and the Ottawa Paramedics regarding the death of Adair Ahmad Abdi. Um, another, thing that we, another demand that we also had was for the Attorney General Yasser Nakvi to also mandate the implementations of the Yakabuchi Report uh, regarding persons uh, living in mental crisis, and mental disabilities, and things like that. Um, again, this report was released, uh, I think, last year, I believe. And a lot of the things that in this report have not been mandated by the province, have not been followed on by police uh, bodies, even though these are things that should be followed to make the system a bit better, right? Um, another thing we're asking for is the full public release, obviously, of the investigation by the SIU into the, uh, the killing and the public lynching of Abdi Rahman Abdi. Those are just some of the demands that we're asking for and we're going to be continuing to be asking for and holding the SIU accountable, holding the government accountable, and holding the police accountable. Great. And I think the big issue now is what I call the SIU and what, 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 what is this organization? Because people just don't know. Can you go into it and tell us a little bit more about yeah, it? Yeah, so we're talking about the SIU being the ones who investigate police in a case like Abdi Rahman Abdi. The SIU is made up almost entirely of former police officers investigating current police officers. They call Hold this... Hold on, I'm sorry. So the people who are investigating are part of the same organizations? They're former officers. The idea is that they are but the But once you're a police ones... officer and you're part of that brotherhood, you'll never really leave it, right? I think so. Yeah. But the province obviously disagrees. And so it hires... Hold on, so what if we had criminals, cr like, investigating other criminals? Well, I mean... Like, it's just weird to me that, like, is, it, is there a conflict of interest in that? I think that inherently the SIU, because of who's working on it, is unable to do its job properly. I think it needs more actual civilians if you're going to call it civilian oversight. But isn't it supposed to be independent? Well, it is technically independent, but when you look at the membership, when you look at the biases of the SIU, when you look at the kind of cases that the SIU says no charges needed here. I, I need to emphasize to your audience, Hodan, that the SIU does not decide whether an officer is innocent or guilty of a crime. All the SIU does is decide whether or not they should even be charged with a crime in the first place. And 97% of the time, the SIU looks at a case involving a police officer and says no charges. So that's the huge problem that we're having with this oversight. And Hashem talks also about reports. So people will tell us, hey, if you are angry about the death of Abdi Rahman Abdi, wait for the report. I can't wait for the report because the reports are not made public. 
people demanded outside of that police station in April that all of the report of Andrew Loku be released because no officer was charged in killing Andrew Loku either. The province only released about one third of the report. And even now, the Premier, Kathleen Wynne, is telling us that we might see parts of the report. So hold Mr. on, Biden. who pays for this organization? Is it taxpayers' of money? Of course it is. So why are we not entitled to see these reports? This is the question that all of us have for Premier Wynne, is why are you calling it oversight when your report is secret, when the decision and all of the justification of why you don't charge the officers is secret, how can you call that accountability? We do not consider this to be accountability. I must say though that I commend my friends at Black Lives Matter because they have been the ones that have been holding the Premier to account for this lack of transparency. And we really need to push Premier Wynne to make sure that every page of every single SIU report once it is completed is available to the public because that is our money that's paying for it. It just seems shocking that, yeah, this is taxpayers' money, but we're not allowed to see the reports. And when we talk about black lives, never in the history of the SIU, 25 years and counting, has the SIU charged an officer who killed a black individual in this province. Never. And that tells you about the state of anti-black racism in Canada today and Ontario today more than anything I can think of. Well, this has been a very powerful conversation, and I thank you both for joining me. Um, sometimes the most uncomfortable conversations start the biggest changes in our society. This is Integration. You can continue the conversation online with us, always on social media, YouTube, 24 hours a day, on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for joining us, and we appreciate your viewership. Take care.